welcome to this presentation on Dickinson's Birds by Marta Warner. Um, and I don't, I don't think I need to tell everybody who Marta is very much. She uh, has influenced the way I've, I read Dickinson and I'm sure a lot of other people, but just to run through um, her influential works among other publications, excuse me while I admit all, um, it was open folios in 1996, which changed what we think of as the corpus of Dickinson's work by inviting us to consider um, more deeply the late short writings. Um, her collaboration with artist Jen Bourbon on The Gorgeous Nothings, which again changed our understanding of Dickinson's body of work by showing how important an, an aspect of the materiality of her poems can be, especially of these late works. An essay in the networked recluse, the catalog to the 2016 Morgan Library exhibition of items from the Dickinson archives, which brought together materials that showed Dickinson's direct engagement with her social and historical world. And she's about to come out with a new edition of the Master Letters, the ambiguous status of which has vexed readers for generations. Um, so obviously she's interested in the materiality of, of the poem, of the, the actual object. But I also have always been struck by the way her work is listening for communications for voices that are scarcely audible and her interest in archives themselves and the, the concept of an archive is a way of dredging out um, or, or eliciting things that are almost but not quite completely buried and in some ways the most um, delightful thing that I've uh, ever heard her deliver was a 2015 address at the annual meeting about Eb Ebenezer Sn Snell's weather journal that a lot of people are talking about now. It was the first I had ever heard of Ebenezer Snell's weather journal in the Amherst archive, but she found in these little weather annotations of a whole life lived and the dynamics of what was going on in a family. Um, in Marta's scholarship, she hears and expresses the improbable richness of the inaudible voices of the past. Here she is. Thank you so much. And Dan, thank you so much for that introduction. It was so very, very kind. Um, and a huge shout out to uh, Parik and Adeline and Elizabeth, too, for organizing this amazing um, virtual event. <laughs> I've been amazed at how smoothly everything has gone. Um, and thank you for finding space for me on this program, uh, because I come to you with a presentation, but also uh, an invitation. And I've put this first screen up here because I want uh, to establish from the very beginning that this is a collaborative project and one that couldn't happen without um, my first two collaborators, Caroline McGraw, an advanced graduate student in digital humanities, and Abe Kim, um, a computer programmer. Uh, but now we, need, uh, now we need your help. So without further ado, um, oops. I'm not quite sure how I did that, but we'll see. <laughs> and in case something goes off with the audio, um, you should be able to see the text. With the exception of only a few months, Emily Dickinson lived her entire life in Amherst, Massachusetts, deep in the Connecticut River Valley, where the primary biome is temperate deciduous forest composed of oak, maple, beech, and elm. Above the forest canopy and hidden in its understory were the wild songbirds of Dickinson's world, the birds that still dart and whirr through her poems, letters, and fragments. Of the more than 500 species of birds known to nest in this fertile valley or to pass through it, she named a relatively small number, possibly just those she heard from her window or observed in her garden. Robins, bobolinks, sparrows, jays, crows, eagles, cardinals, orioles, larks, phoebes, black and blue birds, hummingbirds, owls, eider ducks, swans, whippoorwills, partridges, cuckoo birds, doves, linnets, and wrens, and a few that must instead have alighted from the pages of her books, lapwings, uh, nightingales, peacocks. Yet birds crowd Dickinson's work, her fascicles shelter so many birds that at times they seem like nests. And when she turns from fascicle gatherings to loose bifolium sheets, the birds migrate with her. 
and even her latest fragments carry birds or turn into them. Just as the birds are ever present in her writings, so birdsong is arguably the most constant evanescent sound she recorded through writing in an age before the technologies of recording had been invented. Birds' sound making is also place making. It orients humans to our own ecological emplacement in nature, locale, and time. As we have long known, for Dickinson, the birds were harbingers of the seasons of the year and even the hours of the day. After the long New England winter, their dawn and dusk choruses broke open the biophony to sound the unaccountable fullness of our terrestrial condition in a music as numerous as space. While the birds vary departures in late summer and fall for their wintering ranges and their many returns to Amherst in the early spring with the ice still in the pools, affirmed for Dickinson the cyclical eternal nature of life forms of our planet, their brief lives and often witnessless deaths seem to have given her an exact imagination of our own similarly contingent, vulnerable and common existence in time and weather. In Dickinson's world, 19th century world, birdsong was almost certainly fuller and less marked than it is for inhabitants of the 21st century. Yet Dickinson also lived in the post-industrial period when new technologies were changing the sound of the world forever. Even the small site of Amherst, Massachusetts reverberated with change. Between 1830 and 1870, the town's population rose by 53%, and the sounds that entered Dickinson's windows suddenly included not only those of the old earth, but also the din of 3,000 to 4,000 new human inhabitants and their new occupations. By 1850, Massachusetts had witnessed the loss of 60% of its forests, one of the most devastating ecological losses in American history. And in her lifetime, Dickinson saw and heard the quiet farms that had prevailed in the landscape, outnumbered by clamorous textile and paper mills, brickyards, and tool factories. In 1853, perhaps the greatest disturbance of all pierced the soundscape of Amherst, the passenger train originating in Belchertown, cut through the town, its jarring hiss and the screech of its brakes, a strange stimulus for birdsong. A train went through the burial gate, a bird broke forth and sang. While clairaudient access to the past is not likely to be possible even in a distant future, the prospect of hearing again through the mind's more speculative ear, one thin bandwidth of Dickinson's vanished soundscape, by capturing, albeit incompletely, the calls and songs of the distant descendants of her birds may still be salutary. Following Dickinson's birds, moreover, prompts a swirl of questions at the intersection of poetics and ecology that seem to connect the past and the present. What birds appear most commonly in Dickinson's writings, and why are so many of her references to unnamed birds? How does she record or translate the sounds of the birds she hears in the medium of writing? In what years or periods of her writing are allusions to birds most numerous, and in what periods do their numbers diminish? What accounts for the waxing and waning of the birds across her work? Since birdsong travels across human-made boundaries, how might it have unsettled or enlarged Dickinson's sense of geographical context? Do her bird writings manifest an awareness, conscious or unconscious, of the larger ecological changes occurring around her? How might new disturbances in the soundscape of her world have signified to Dickinson, who grew up reading in the Book of Nature? While Dickinson could not have foreseen the prospect of a silent spring, was an early intuition of the ecological crisis audible to her in the second half of the 19th century. Tapping into the oldest and innermost part of our brain, sound imparts immediate data, telling us where we are and whether it is safe, along with relational data that tells us how far we are from other familiar things. When sounds are missing, that too tells us something. Does the bird song that though already diminished still welcomes us into Dickinson's world make us preternaturally aware of the deeper silences in our own? How might we measure the ecological distances, the changed meters between Dickinson's sound world and our own, while also attending to those soundings, however faint, 
that propose new pathways for moving forward in an altered world, new opportunities for attunement and ethical engagement with the beings whose otherness is palpable, but with whom we nonetheless share an uncertain future. In March 2020, in the earliest ending of winter, which if you don't know it is, a, is an allusion to Stevens, Wallace Stevens' beautiful last poem. In the earliest ending of winter and the long beginning of the pandemic, I spent more time than usual at my desk, reading and watching the world outside. The variorum of Dickinson's poems lay open beside me and before, and before me and beside it, Clark's 1887, The Birds of Amherst and Hampshire County. In the middle distance between laptop screen and window pane, poems and birds and questions kept crossing. How could I make a book of Dickinson's birds, that is to say her poems, addressed to readers of the Anthropocene that would not be a snare? How could a book of Dickinson's birds conjure an awareness of what accepted categories cannot contain, what familiar taxonomies cannot order, what one medium cannot express? How could an archive not turn into an exhibit with all of its ties to the cabinet of curiosities and worse, the specimen case, but instead become a miscellany and a murmuration? Dickinson's Birds arises out of these unsettled questions. A digital humanities work of the third wave, it is necessarily a hybrid combining elements of the documentary archive and the scholarly edition, but claiming neither as an identity. For while we hope that like the archive as recently described by Arlette Farge, Dickinson's birds will be experienced as a spring tide and as an opening into a hidden world. And further, that like the carefully prepared scholarly edition, it remains responsible to the material forms and textual evolution of Dickinson's poems. It has let go of the Gnostic desire to store and classify her works for eternity, characteristic of both these structures. Instead, by setting digital, sur digital surrogates of approximately 350 manuscript witnesses from Dickinson's oeuvre that name or allude to birds, and 350 plus audio files and sonograms of the sounds of Amherst's avifauna in relation to the unfolding hours of the day, the revolution of the seasons, and the calendar of her writing life, Dickinson's Birds seeks to make possible a durational encounter with her poems and other writings that illuminates them as part of that flickering, shimmering field of forces without independent existence and in constant flux. And Dickinson's lyric oeuvre itself as an entropic place in which the constant surging of time presages its eventual dissolution and passing away. Set quietly behind not only archive and edition, but also before the unimaginatively vast and inhuman scale of the implacable Anthropocene itself, Dickinson's Birds is perhaps best described as a fragile mode of inquiry allied to a brief moment in the 21st century and the unthinkable stakes associated with it. It seeks, it seeks to stir intensified concern with the smallest, most vulnerable, and most ephemeral things, poems and birds, in the belief that small things, too, have their infinity. To build an archive to shelter small things requires much labor. This past year, I worked with my collaborators, a digital humanist, Caroline McGraw, and a computer programmer, Abe Kim, to create the databases that hold the contents of this archive and the design of the public-facing components. We assembled archives of manuscripts and archives of bird songs and soundings. We sifted poems and combed through 19th century guides to the birds of the Connecticut Valley in Massachusetts. The work, the early work of Ebenezer Evans, J.A. Allen, who happened to be a philologist, uh, and H.L. Clark. We studied the vast 21st century data on birds collected by instruments more sensitive than human eyes and human ears. The pages of a virtual bird book do not unfold like those of the codex, whose actual order never alters no matter how many times we mentally reassemble it in our memories or imaginations. Instead, the virtual book allows for more speculative arrangements and interleavings. 
By a sleight of hand, a touch, a tap, Dickinson's birds metamorphoses from one archive into many possible archives generated on the fly. Archives of fascicle bird poems or bifolium sheet bird poems, of bird poems sent across the miles or those that never circulated beyond Dickinson's private paper archives of beautiful fair copy bird poems and of still more beautiful rough copy bird poems, archives of blackbirds and bluebirds, bobolinks, archives of spring, summer, fall and winter bird poems, of morning and evening bird poems, and archives of the birds themselves, singing, nesting, migrating, endangered. And just to sort of show you what the um, the indexes will look like a little bit. This is a scrolling page um, where all the poems appear in manuscript if we have a manuscript uh, and then when and all of the birds uh, appear with their name sonogram um, and an audio file. There's various kinds of ways of searching. And then um, we go a little bit deeper. So tapping on a manuscript or a bird leads you deeper into the meshwork of the archive, the metadata associated with each file. And there's not really a lot of time to look at all this, but just to give you the quickest sense, right, you have the poem, a transcription, the manuscript, um, a reference to any affiliated variant manuscripts, commentary, and then if there is a named bird, you have or more than one, you have a carousel of the birds named in the poem um, that you can move through and, and listen to. And the bird archive uh, is a little bit different, organized a little bit differently. And this, uh, this page just shows you um, things particular to the bird when it arrived in the 19th, 20th, and 21st century into Amherst and then departed, its conservation status, field notes culled from um, many, many sources, particularly in the 19th century. In addition to these flying indices of palms and birds, three digital objects or instruments, a map, a bird ring, and a time sound line are portals into the archive. While each fosters immersion in the processes of worlding, the map tilts toward the human world, the bird ring toward the non-human, and the time sound line seeks to enact an enjambment of worlds. And here we're still designing the final forms of these. So I'm just showing you the barest images um, of, the, of these digital instruments. First, there is always a map. Here, a map is many maps, a virtual atlas composed of 32 semi-translucent maps, one for every year between 1854 and 1886, lightly inscribed with the bird poems itineraries. On each map, lines trace the route a manuscript travels from its point of departure to its destination of, and connect sender and addressee, writer and reader. By laying one virtual map over another, it is possible to perceive the changing configurations of Dickinson's correspondence, bird correspondence, over a period of years, or to compare the configurations of her correspondence at two moments in time distant from one another. Like all maps, the atlas also opens into the realm of the spatial imaginary. By measuring the geographical space separating writer from reader, it invites us to contemplate more intangible experiences of intimacy and distance in the 19th century. Moreover, while the link between sender remains the most direct and legible, other more hidden relations among apparently disparate readers, among poems sent in a single spring, may also manifest so that the map metamorphoses into a mist net or skein of contingent connections, the beginnings of a cartographic prosopography of Dickinson's correspondence and of the poems themselves. The Massachusetts map we chose as our substrate was made by 14-year-old Frances Elsa Penshaw in 1823 for a class in geography and penmanship given at the Middlebury Female Academy, um, once run by Emma Willard, the very famous American map maker. Originally hand-drawn and colored by Henshaw on a loose leaf, it was later bound in marble boards in a slender volume containing 18 additional maps, along with descriptions of the Ptolemic, Branian, Copernican systems of astronomical geography, the meridian, the horizon, the zones, and the climates. While Henshaw's maps are copies of the maps in Carey's 1805 American Pocket Atlas, they are also singular and luminous objects. In them, as in Dickinson's manuscripts, the stroke of writing sweeps out to meet the stroke of drawing. 
The naivete of Henshaw's map, no legend or scale is included, imparts a dreamlike, strangely timeless quality to it. It is hard to find one's footing here, and much easier to drift from the finely calligraphied place names in sepia to the blurrier outlines in rose and where water meets the land in charcoal. Amherst itself is nowhere on the map, but the basalt mountain ranges surrounding it are rendered in expressive branching scribbles and contour lines, and the rivers Merrimack, Narragansett, and Connecticut appear as dark arteries winding through the landscape. Unlike the names of towns captured within the map's artificial borders, the mountains and rivers formed in the last ice age flow in Henshaw's pen and ink over them into empty unmapped space. They are a kind of counter writing over the human map, an acknowledgement that every map represents only a tiny island of reality that leaves most of the world undisturbed by human representation. Like the ancient astrolabe that inspired it, the bird calendar is designed as a ring or wheel. Here though, instead of capturing the brightest stars and deep sky objects visible in the northern or southern hemisphere in a given season and exact hour of the day, the calendar illuminates the bright arrivals and departures of the birds across particular months and seasons of the year as observed from the coordinates of Amherst, Massachusetts. Against a fixed disk marking the intervals of the Earth's rotation around the sun, three overlays spinning about a common pivot point, one documenting the 19th century arrival and departure dates of the birds, a second noting the 20th century arrival and departure dates of their distant descendants, and a third marking the birds' 21st century arrival and departure dates, indicate that the cycles of the natural world, once presumed to be eternally unchanging, are shifting century by by century and perhaps moment by moment. The bird ring is also a sound ring where small variations and imperfect rhymings across centuries of the bird's migratory patterns may signal the warming of the world and call on us to calibrate our passage in a new climate in extremis. Finally, of the three divining objects, the timeline is the one most finely calibrated to a register suspended equally between the human and non-human worlds. Traversing the span of Dickinson's lyric writing, it marks the advent or circulation of each no po new poem as an isolated burst, a pulsating dot linked to the sound of the bird within it. Like the wave machines of the 19th century, um, the timeline makes visible and audible the larger rhythms of Dickinson's imagination of birds from the spring of 1854 to that of 1886. Set to autoplay, it carries us across the years and seasons when her poems are flush with bird song and those when the sounds of the birds are few or far between, makes audible the recurrent appearances of particular birds and bears witnesses, bears witness to the disappearance of others. By listening to the cumulative sounds along the line and their successive unfurling, we may be rewarded by a new capacity to hear the fragile and differentiated cadences of Dickinson's birdscape. Alternatively, by lightly tapping on points along the line to listen at once in and out of time to a single season or a solitary bird, we may receive both a sudden intuition of the long durée in which the soundings of Dickinson's birds reverberate against the soundings of the birds made outside the precincts of human history and memory, and a heightened experience of the present moment in which our finger falls on a keyboard are part of the manifold and ephemeral data of the world we listen to and create. By looking at Dickinson's birds and poems through the lenses of each of these instruments, we are summoned to engage the protocols um, of both distant reading, uh, the aggregation and scrutiny of vast amounts of data, and those of very, very close reading at once. But further conversation about these portals must be postponed so that I may end uh, with an invitation. To Dickinson scholars and readers, regional historians, environmentalists and bird watchers, climate researchers and activists, soundscape ecologists and artists, students of the non-human turn and makers of deep map, to all those lovers of birds and poetry who though scattered between the poles of the earth are listeners in the era of the sixth extinction. 
I seek your contributions to this project and your collaboration. In January of 2021, the first iteration of Dickinson's Birds will go live as an open access site hosted at the Center for Textual Studies and Digital Humanities at Loyola. At this moment, and this moment will also mark the beginning of the next phase of its evolution. For it is our greatest hope that all who come to the site will also contribute to it in their own way and thus become our collaborators and co-authors. We seek collaborations um, authored and unauthored of all kinds and in all genres, including recordings, Dan has already given me some, uh, field notes and environmental data, reflections on the significance of bird song to our sense of emplacement, close readings of Dickinson's bird writings, meditations on the lyric in the Anthropocene, creative responses of all kinds to Dickinson's birds, and of course, suggestions and corrections. So thank you so much for your patience. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, that's fascinating and, uh, and, and very beautifully. It's the most beautiful description of a database um, I think <laughs> that I've, ever, that I, I, I've ever seen in my life. It, it was wonderful. And I suspect some people have questions and I'll try to navigate through. But I'll start by just asking you to um, respond to something. And I wanted to talk to you about this before because in, in listening for birds, really just playfully since once I heard what you were doing. Um, but I did, you know, I was on walks first in, in North Carolina and then up where I am now in Vermont. And I, in order to listen for, I mean, birds are always something I'm kind of aware of, but in order to listen for them and to think what's going to be a good sound bite, um, I had to toggle in between where I actually was <laughs> with people doing something and I really had to, more than physically, but I had to sort of pull back my mind into another space. And is, is that typical or is that just because I'm not sufficiently sensitive to birds? No, I think that's beautifully put actually. And I think that that suggests that you really were really listening, right? That, that pulling back into another space, that attentiveness. I, I think that's, I mean, that's something that the project even with its many frustrations, and I'll tell you, after recording um, data about 500 different birds, <laughs> I thought, damn these birds, there are just too many of them. Um, but, but, but the truth is, is that it required from me a kind of patience that I don't always give to things and an attentiveness to listening um, that has really changed my reading practices um, and also the way that I listen to the world. So I think that, I think that the way that you or what you felt is a very common experience. And especially because we have so much interference, right? So we don't hear bird song purely, right? unless we're in a very, very remote, uh, remote area. And so we're always filtering, right? There's always this kind of interesting filtering process that goes on. And of course, one thing that makes our soundscape so different from Dickinson's is that level uh, of, of interference. Um, there are other questions, some little blue hands, and then it looks like there's a rich chat going on. But let's start with some of the hands. I saw Tom Daly had something. Are, are you there, Tom? Yeah. Uh, I want to just first say, Martha, that your scholarship is as eloquent as the poetry that you are related to. I've always appreciated the extraordinary articulation that you present. It's like listening to poetry to hear you. And it was actually wonderful to have your talk uh, scrolling down so I could actually read it as well as, as listen to it. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm very interested in the maps that you talked about and I'm, I'm assuming those will be available in the archive. And the other thing is that you made a statement, I don't wanna quibble with such an incredible presentation, but you made a statement that the most vulnerable were the birds, the poems and birds, the smallest and most vulnerable. But I would think that Emily Dickinson might disagree with you. I'm, I'm always talking to my birder friends about, what do you think it's like to be a worm in relation <laughs> to, a, to a bird? A, a worm is a little more vulnerable 
than a bird and the cat a bird. <laughs> Absolutely. And I hope you'll forgive you'll forgive a poetic license there. Um, and in fact, it's interesting. The the reason that what brought me to that um, to that statement was reading a, a wonderful book that probably so many of you have read called The World Without Us by Alan Weiss. And there's a chapter in that book where he talks about just how much art has been lost, right? That we will never know existed. Um, and the, it's an extraordinary amount. I think it's more than like 97% of everything that was ever created, you know, let's say from the ancient world, but also even in newer times, um, is no longer, is gone completely. And so that made me think a lot, sort of thinking again on the scale of the Anthropocene, um, of what, what will be left? Right. Will there be, I mean, at a certain point, um, th there will be nothing, right? There will be no poems, there will be uh, nothing at all, right? And, and so it was that sense um, of vulnerability. But I think that when, when you think about the worm, right, or even something else, right, something tinier than the worm, that the, the real issue is, right, that, that we are all living at an exceptionally vulnerable moment. Um, whether we consciously think about that a lot or whether we don't or whether it just comes to us. And um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a textual scholar by, by trade, but I, I felt like I had to do something different, that I had to think about what, what it is that I do in my professional life in a context that is almost unthinkable um, and that includes, right, it includes the loss of everything. Um, Emily Sealbinder. Okay. Um, Marta, I was wondering if in your um, recordings and gatherings of material, you've used any of the wonderful resources from Cornell University, the All About Birds site. Um, and they're um, in particular. Absolutely, I'm all about birds. Well, the the Merlin app, um, which they they've made available, is also really useful for identifying the birds. So I, I was wondering if if you are seeking new recordings from Emily Dickinson's region, or if some of the recordings that that Cornell provides. Um, would, would also serve your purposes. Absolutely. I, I found the Cornell site very early on and I thought I, I hit a gold mine. Um, and not only a gold mine for the audio files, but also because they have so much constantly updating information on conservation status, habitat, everything. So I, I, I consider them um, a, a major collaborator, even though they might not know it. Uh, and then there's another, there's another site called Zeno Canto, which is um, mm -hmm. an open access site where where, they, where thousands, and I mean thousands and thousands, of bird songs and sounds and calls and wing beats are uploaded, and the files and the sonograms are, are entirely um, open access. So I've used those a lot too. And of course, my, my hope is to um, both get the, the sounds of uh, recordings very close to the area, right, in, in Amherst and, the, and Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts. But the more I thought about that, and when I first started collecting recordings, um, I, I would always look to see where was that recording made, and I tried very hard to get the recording that was from Massachusetts. And then I realized that my, um, that I, I was being a kind of nationalist or a statist in some ways, I, and that in fact birds don't really care, and that this bird that I think of as an amorous Massachusetts bird spends its winter you know, in Argentina. Um, and so I started, my, my technique changed, and I started looking at the birds, but then to see just how far their ranges were, and taking um, recordings from um, all over the world, so long as it was an identified bird that either uh, inhabited or crossed through Massachusetts. But it's ongoing, and yeah, I do want new recordings. I would, I would love, um, I, I would love to have recordings. And and I'm assuming you're familiar with this. Yes, indeed, I am. I very, it's, very much so. I don't know if it's still in print, but it's it's such a lovely collection of Dickinson's poems and then contemporaneous um, 
illustrations, bird illustrations. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. It, it is a beautiful book. And, you know, one of the, there's so many beautiful sort of Dickinson bird things. I mean, there's the Joseph Cornell, the beautiful bird uh, mm -hmm. kind of boxes. And there's also been so much scholarship. And I, I meant to say at the opening of this talk right, that I, I'm so indebted to um, people who've, who've published recently and not so recently on, uh, on Dickinson and ornithology. Right? It's been a tremendous sort of resource for me. Um, and, uh, and I'm grateful to all of that scholarship. Um, let's take a few more questions. I do want to leave people some time to, to stretch a little bit before the final session, but there's a, there are a lot of questions. Jamie Fenton, I think, had a hand up, and then Adalberto, and then we'll see. I, um, I can only um, reiterate what everyone said. That was a beautiful presentation and just some really gorgeous critical prose. So thank you so much. Um, I've been working on Dickinson and sound for a while, and it's one of my great frustrations that despite the fact that she was contemporary for 10 years with Edison's first phonograph and that the Springfield Republican mentioned it weekly because everyone was nuts about it, um, that she, she never seemed to acknowledge it. And it's thus hard to know what she thought about sound recording. Um, and my question is whether you think that her bird poems are a record as in a log or if they aspire to be a recording and can in some way kind of work to do what the phonograph was doing, whether or not Dickinson was aware what that was. That's such a fascinating question. And it recalls something that I was very interested in in the talk that you gave, uh, or maybe it was a comment after the talk where you said that you think of Dickinson as a poet on the page. And I, I have to say, I completely agree with you <laughs> in the sense that what I'm, what I'm not trying to do in Dickinson's Birds is to imagine, because I don't think Dickinson was trying to do it, um, Mabel and Miss Todd, for instance, in her diaries, she has, the, and a lot of 19th century types did this, right? They would listen to a bird song and then they would try to kind of write it out as music. Dickinson, of course, doesn't do that. And where I think you're getting um, the, the sound, right? I think it's less a matter of, it's partly a matter of hearing, but how do you hear a page, right? And how do you hear, um, how do you hear the vivacity of Dickinson's poems? Right? Because there's something that is incredibly vivacious and moving. Everything is always moving. And it's in that that I feel the sound. So it's interesting. I, somebody asked me, I, I can't remember when, but a long time ago, if I was going to include um, people sort of reading Dickinson's bird poems. And I think, I'm sure that that would be a lovely project, but it's sort of not the project I'm, I'm interested in because I... I feel like that the the music is very internal, uh, and there's a kind of that internal music um, expresses itself uh, visually on the page and in that extraordinary um, deft kind of, um, of of writing itself. And there's something that I want to preserve of that of that reserve, I guess. Uh, I would almost, I would almost say, I'm not sure if this makes sense yet. I, I haven't found a good way of talking about, about that sense of, of interior hearing. Um, but I was very struck and I thought I should send you an email <laughs> and ask you because you seem to have an insight into it that, um, that I don't have yet. And, uh, and I'd love to hear more about it. Hardly any, I'm sure, but thank you so much for your answer. Um, okay, Adalberto and then Elizabeth Bradley. I, I'm curious to hear you ask your question after, but Adalberto, go ahead. Thanks, Marta. I'm, I'm very excited for uh, seeing this uh, website working. And, and I just want to share with you, with you all, that uh, almost all the birds, because I translated everything, almost all the birds are translatable, except for the whippoorwill, the <laughs> only one that we don't have. But that, that that means that I wanted to say that it, how how do you consider thinking uh, the migration aspect of the birds because this is I think that the the birds unite us. Yes, yes, that's so beautifully put. And of course, the second I was thinking of you, poet of the garden, also. Um, but thinking of of how what would be lovely to add to this site would be something on translation and translation as. Um, or migration also as a form of translation. And I mean, I'm curious, right? Does, 
is it the case? Does a bird, does a does a wren singing in um, Amherst, Massachusetts, given everything that's around it, right, the very different kind of environment, does it sound the same, or does that environmental change through migration actually change um, qu qualitatively the nature of the sound? Um, so I'm, I'm hoping, right, I'm hoping that some translators, uh, and <laughs> that would be you, <laughs> and some other people here, hopefully. Um, would be interested in, in, in really thinking through that question of translation and migration. Um, Elizabeth Bradley, are you still there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, so I'm a Hampshire County bird watcher, so I'm very enthusiastic about your presentation. And I uh, have a lot of thoughts, which maybe I'll just email you. But I had a one question, which is how are you choosing what audio files to, to select? Is it all the same? Is it based on the poem? Birds might have a song or a warning call or a companion call, as you would know if you were on All About Birds, which often represents all of those different calls for us. That is such a great question. And first of all, I, I really hope one of the groups that I'd hope to address um, were all of the, the birders, particularly around, you know, in Hampshire County, uh, because you know things much more than I do about, about birds. <laughs> I have to confess that I was pretty much ignorant about birds when I started this project, and I'm still pretty ignorant. Uh, but one of the things that listening and trying to choose recordings um, really showed me was how many different sounds you could be talking about right? and, uh, and, what, and how to do that. So I had a couple of, um, of standards and one of them, the first one was in fact the quality of the recording. Uh, just because I'm thinking about how, it, you know, because it's going to be connected to so many things, we'll connect it to the timeline, the bird ring, all of these things. So the sound, um, in some senses, th that quality is important. I was also looking often, um, and this is something that's very clear on the Zeno Canto site, they have things like um, latitudes and longitudes, they have oftentimes information about the very environmental conditions in which you're hearing the song, um, or the sound, or the alarm call, or the wing beat. Uh, and so I tried, um, it's, it hasn't been possible yet to make sort of one-to-one -one connections between palms and particular sounds, but I certainly have tried to get um, a, a representative number of sounds. I, I will confess that in the last days, I think I chose a lot of alarm calls. <laughs> I don't know why, but it probably probably some of that selection has something to do with my own um, my own mood at the moment. Uh, but I promise, you know, next time it'll all be song, <laughs> not alarm calls. Um, but there's going to be something rather interesting. One of the one of the things about doing digital work now is that the data is of course saved, and so someone can come and and look at how I chose all of my data, and they can. Uh, and they can assess that, right? And they can probably tell things about my data collection and, and me and my scholarly interests just by looking at, at that enormous amount, um, amount of data. But this, to, to be more practical a little bit here, um, I, I, would, I really, really want the company of many people here. And I really want the company of people who, um, who, are, are, not, who are much more knowledgeable about birds than I am. Uh, and, and can give me some of the um, Im important, tell me where I've gone wrong, like what are, you know, some, are my selection principles incorrect? I, uh, what should I be thinking about when I make these choices? That's very important to me um, and not something that can be, that I can do alone. Um, I think that um, it's probably time for us to get, stretch and get ready for the next session. But there is a, a terrific chat, which I've saved and I'm now saving again.